Recordings in progress. Uh, got it. Um, may I invite you, if you haven't yet got your camera switched on, please do switch your camera on. And if you're in a quiet place, please open your microphone. We're not such a big group that we have to treat this as a, a formal conference. We can uh, we can have a conversation. And what I'm intending for, from what I've got for you is that we have a bunch of small group conversations, breakout conversations of the kind that you might have if you were in a room with a bunch of people. The reason for that, well, there are a bunch of reasons for that. One, it makes it more fun and interesting for most people. It also helps you to, um, to make what I'm talking about relevant to you and your specific circumstance and your organization. So it gives you an opportunity to think about how it applies to you. The third thing is that one of the things we're going to be doing is a skill-based activity around this thing called clean language. And by practicing the skill, you'll have a much richer experience than if I just tell you about it. Is that okay with everybody? Yeah. Thank you. Um, as, as ever with these kind of things, I do appreciate that not everybody can actively participate in breakout group activities. If you can't, then please give me some kind of indication so that somebody else isn't sitting there wondering what's going on because they're on their own. Um, but, uh, you know, if I call you to, to join a breakout and you can't, then uh, I appreciate that may not be possible for you. OK, so diving into the content, um, I'm going to quickly share my slides in the chat um, in case you want to follow along on a second screen. I'm also showing the odd slide behind me, but I'm not here reading from PowerPoint, fingers crossed. The idea is that we talk about some interesting stuff. Specifically, we're going to talk about one of the reasons that reimagining the future of work is so tricky for so many people. Um, hopefully we're going to expand your thinking around that topic, but we're also going to use this, these breakthrough tools that are basically optimized for the task of exploring things that people find difficult to talk about. Clean language and metaphor. I know that some of the people on the call have experienced those tools before, um, but not all. So don't worry if you're not aware of what clean language is, I will explain a little later on. Um, Luke is highlighting that he doesn't work for an organization. Um, quite right. Um, this is not going to be an introduction to Agile. Uh, I am an, I'm an Agile enthusiast, but I'm not an Agile coach or a Scrum Master or anything of that kind. I've got a topic to talk about, which is the shape of work to come. And uh, hopefully, hopefully you'll learn something about Agile as you um, meet the people through the course of the session. First question then, your team or a team you know about is like what? Please take a moment to think privately about your answer to that question. Your team or a team you know about is like what? The invitation is to draw your answer or write it down, but draw your answer to that question. It's one of those questions with no right or wrong answer. Some teams are, are like a machine. Some teams are like um, a peloton of Tour de France riders. Some teams are like a bunch of, um, a bunch of uh, birds flying in formation. I'm going to quickly change the setting in my headset. I'm being warned that my sound is with me. Is that working? Yeah, much better. Yeah. Much better. Thank you. Okay. So, um, one of the, that's hopefully given you a moment to think about your answer to the question. What's going to happen next is I'm going to invite you to drop into a breakout room with about two other people and um, talk, take a couple of moments to talk about your answer.
The idea being to just compare your drawings. What's similar and what's different in the two drawings? Um, if you're not able to join, a join the breakout, then hopefully, because I've got mostly threes, we'll be fine. Um, if you find yourself after a minute or so and nobody's in the room with you, then um, do come back here. But you're only going to have a couple of minutes plus a 60 second countdown to just compare your drawings. Does that make sense to everybody? Or at least to enough people to get us started. Hitting the button now, you'll see a button coming up saying join breakout. Like most people are back from the rooms. Did you meet someone interesting? I appreciate it, it was a very, very short conversation, but uh, at least we're getting the conversation started. Now, I'm curious, um, who found someone who had exactly the same answer to this question? Dan, excellent, Dan and Tiziano, go on, <laughs> do tell. Oh, it was kind of scary. So basically, here's, here's, my, here's my picture. Um, it, uh, we're we're kind of all over the place. We're not cohesive. Mm -hmm. We're heading up all mm -hmm. in different directions, and it's frustrating the hell out of me. So I, I could have maybe I could have drawn hell on on a car. <laughs> <laughs> um, all in different directions, yeah. and it, it's it's frustrating the hell out of you. Mm -hmm. And who had the same? Tiziano. Yep. Do, do, I draw a bunch of people uh, all around uh, uh, not being cohesive. Uh, uh, so it, it's a, a team that is. Uh, a long journey to to be a a team, a crazy team. Yep. Mm -hmm. Would Would you show the, show your drawing? Yep. Uh, I don't know if you can see. Uh, mm. No, no, no. Not quite. Maybe. Never mind. No, but... Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Plus me, so, it's a bunch of people uh, all around. <laughs> Yeah, so all around and all yep. and not cohesive and on a journey yep. to to being more cohesive. And oh, well, I raise my hand, Judy, uh, because I think that uh, Zach in our room uh, has something very similar to drawing to the drawing that it, Daniel and it's not a million miles away in that it's got arrows, but I think the middle is slightly more coherent because we are reasonably cohesive. We're just doing one thing, which is the kind of quote Sunday Uplands big arrow, and then we mm -hmm. have random stuff and things which aren't the, what we're supposed to be doing, but we have to do them anyway. Lovely. Thank you very much for sharing that, all those examples, because they illustrate something, lots of different beautiful things. One thing that they illustrate is that things that seem at one level similar are also different if you look more closely. So if you notice, um, Dan's drawing had arrows, but I think it had eight arrows and there was nothing in the middle. Zach's drawing had three arrows, but they weren't single line arrows. They were quite big arrows and there was something in the middle. And Tiziano's drawing, we couldn't see it, but he said there were people in it but they were not coherent. Not coherent was the bit that was similar. Now, this is sort of obvious to say that when people draw their teams, everybody has similarities and also differences, but it's terribly easy to think when we hear what someone else says that we know exactly what they mean. And we'll come back to that point in a few minutes, if that's okay. Also notice who had something different in their drawing, who's willing to share? Abby. It's a teapot. It's a teapot. What kind of teapot is that teapot? It's a warm teapot where people sort of gravitate to and get, get warmth and refreshment and nourishment. Thank you. And who had something different? Not a teapot. Mike. Yeah, just a, a herd of chickens. A herd of chickens. <laughs> what kind of chickens? Um, very independent and just free range, doing whatever they want, chickens. Mm, so free range, doing whatever they want, chickens. Now, when we hear about free range, doing whatever they want, chickens, 
we can notice similarities to Dan's all going in different directions, but we can also notice differences. There were no chickens in Dan's, in Dan's drawing. So we'll, we'll keep on re-engaging with this question. Do you think the football match might have finished? No, <laughs> it hasn't. <laughs> I'm afraid I'm not keeping track of what time it started, but suddenly there are more people in the room. Hello, welcome if you're just joining. So we've just done a little activity in which we've been drawing our teams. Next, let me just move us on to the issue that I mentioned with imagining remote teams. There's something very interesting. As people more and more are registering this whole, well, some of us at least are going to go back to the office question. The people who know about remote working and who do a lot of thinking about it are talking about the fact that when you are working remotely, it's not just about space. One of the other big questions to deal with is time. So, for example, um, this rather excellent uh, comment from Rachel ben Hamu that the main challenge of working remotely, it, it, the main challenge of working remotely is not about working geographically separatedly. It's actually about working asynchronously, not at the same time necessarily as other people. Let me elaborate a little more. Um, there's a really brilliant model um, from Matt, I don't know how to pronounce his surname, I'm going to guess at Matt Mullenweg, but I, I'm not sure. Um, you might want to look up this model. It it's, it's, was written, it was uh, talked about before the first lockdowns. Matt Mullenweg is someone who's written and talked a lot about remote working for a large number of years. And his big idea is that you can look at remote working on a number of levels and that remote working and, and those levels are all about different levels of autonomy and his nirvana is when people are working Luke this is a, a point where we reconnect back to the question of agile that um, his nirvana is when teams and individuals are working autonomously um, where they then consistently perform better than any in the room group or organization would. And to get to that nirvana, he says, you need to work in an asynchronous way. His level two, the pink one on this diagram, is all about um, the fact that people are remote, but everything is still synchronous. And this is where people ended up when everything went suddenly remote last year. They ended up in far too many meetings, interrupted all the time. Everybody felt they had to talk to each other on Zoom all the time. And a lot of organizations haven't yet fixed that. Matt Mullenweg talks about all sorts of ways that you can move up through these levels, well worth looking up. But it's all about planning to make things asynchronous, <clears throat> excuse me, so that we don't have to have too many meetings. Instead, we can do things like work out how to make decisions, not in meetings, but by, for example, organizing ourselves around a document in which someone sets out what's the decision to be made, what are the things to consider, and then gathers opinions. We could do that in a Slack channel. We could do it in a bunch of different ways. There are online tools like Lumio for doing that. Um, but you don't necessarily have to have a conversation in order to make a decision together. I'm hoping this is making some kind of sense. What I'm going to do is once again invite you to drop into breakout rooms. And I'm also going to reshare the slides so that anybody who, oh, Dex just shared it again, so great. So if you need to look at the slide, if you want to look at the slides, slide seven is where you can find the, um, the diagram that I was showing a moment ago, let me put it back. 
the invitation in the breakouts is to have a, have a think about this model and see how think about how does it apply to your organization so how does this model apply to your organization once again you're just going to have a short amount of time i'm going to make it a bit longer than the last one four minutes plus the countdown timer do join if you can if you can't then by all means stay here and we'll sort out if people are left on their own shortly everybody okay with the task open the rooms now some useful conversations I think that's everybody back in the room or nearly everybody, the last few people. So, did you have some useful conversations? Let's hear a few headlines. Well, I start sharing, uh, Judy. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, actually it was the last point of, uh, of uh, the session in the breakout rooms, okay? And we, we, we are in Europe, and one of the, the member, Gloria, actually is, is in Canada, okay? So now we are connected in the same moment in the breakout rooms. And so I was wondering how we could have this conversation that we had one minute ago offline, asynchronous. Mm. Okay, so for example, with the chat, okay, that because we are not in the same room all together in the same moment. Mm. And of course, you couldn't have this conversation, but you could have another conversation. Yeah. In in any written format or by sending each other video messages or all these various things. Who talked about something different in your groups? Well, we, I think it was Joshua who's having dinner. Um, we 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 kind of agreed that both the both the, the teams we were thinking about were probably at level um, I think it was level two, um, yes. And so we talked about what it might mean to to move to level three. And there was something about accepting um, accepting that things weren't going to go back to how they were before. Um, mm. Yeah. I think a lot of larger organizations, which is likely to be a lot of a lot of the places where agile coaches work, are in that place of, you know, will we go back to the office? And if so, you know, will it be the same? Will it ever be the same? I yeah, I mean, I, I'm part of an experiment. Obviously, I'm at home today, but I'm part of an experiment where we're going back to the office in, in small groups. And I met with a colleague who I hadn't seen for a year, but and we walked to the cafeteria together and it was really nice. It was, mm -hmm. it was nice to do that, but I was talking with, with, um, with our group and, and, and Ulla, we found a bit of an equilibrium, I think, at home now where, where we've navigated, we're sitting quite nicely with this work from home, dealing with family, just saw my child playing around <laughs> and look at, you know, we're, I think we're, it, it's, we're in a weird space and I, I don't know what to make of it right now. So I don't know what the right thing is. And I know our company is very concerned at losing their culture. They, you know, we have a very family collaborative culture where we are and they're worried that, that we might lose that. Mm. Uh, so. And it, it's, I, I find it really interesting that there, there clearly are organizations like uh, Matt Mullenweg's organization, Automatic with a double T in the middle of it, that have developed ways of working where they have strong culture remotely but if an organization has only ever had a strong culture when they've been able to come together in person how do you do it another way it's not a trivial question now i and a bunch of other people believe that it is possible for organizations to change and to develop new ways of working that still maintain the best of the old and the best of remote but I'm not at all saying that it's a trivial challenge. It's hard. Any other comments on um, how this model applies before we move into the next thing? So I want to pull you into this clean language thing, which is one of the ways that I and the rest of the team at Reese McCann 
help organisations to get more skilled at having some of the tough conversations that have to happen around working, collaborating remotely and uh, getting good at building those cultures. So clean language, oh, let me explain first why this cognitive challenge I mentioned earlier. One of the reasons that it's really hard for people and organizations to think about the future of work, well, there are a couple. One is that people really don't like giving up stuff that they've got that they like. So you've probably heard about an experiment where monkeys put their hands in a hole they could get their, their hand out if they opened it, but if they kept it clenched, they, it held them in position and they were given nuts. And they stayed there with their hands clenched because they didn't want to let go, even though they were trapped. It took a long time for them to let go. And people are like that about advantages like being able to be, spend more time with your family, not having to commute all these things, people don't like to give up the good stuff they've got. Equally, they do want to, to, to be reconnected with other thing, other people and to have some of the advantages of going to the office. So there are difficult conversations to be had, but there's one really cognitive challenge, which is to do with this time space thing we mentioned a moment ago. What we know is that human beings Universally, this applies to all cultures that have been studied, universally represent time in terms of space when they think about it. So a traditional one is to look forward to the future. So you hear the, time, the, the spatial metaphor, look forward or look back at the past. Um, people do it in different ways. Different cultures do it in different ways. So in some cultures, the past is in front of you because you can obviously you can see what happened in the past. So the past is in front of you. Different cultures do it differently, but it's still time represented in a spatial way. At the same time, it, naturally, when we think about remote working, we have to represent that somehow spatially. And trying to put those two things together is complicated, or actually it's complex in, uh, in Snowden's definition. It's one of those things that is really, really head stretching for a lot of people. Therefore, it's worth using some of our very best thinking tools. And metaphor and clean language are two of our very best thinking tools. Um, if you haven't come across clean language before, you might want to look it up after this um, session. I'll share some links towards the end, some resources you can look at. Clean language is a precision inquiry framework that was specifically designed for exploring metaphors. Now, metaphor is the stuff of thought, the native language of the unconscious mind. When we think about anything, we think about it by comparing and contrasting. Just as we compared and contrasted the different people's drawings earlier on. So clean language was designed for exploring metaphor. And it's also very effective for improving understanding in diverse groups and for exploring unknown unknowns in complex contexts. And it was created by the, the late David Grove. I wrote one, I co-authored one of the most popular books on the subject, but it was created by this guy, David Grove. Um, is that enough information for me to explain what we're going to do next and throw you into an activity? Sure. Let's see how this goes. So for this activity, we're going to do a slightly different version of what you did earlier. This time, think about how you would like your team to be. So earlier you thought about how your team is. And if you haven't got a team, feel free to think about a team you know. It will, it will be sufficient for this activity. Let me take you through some questions. Again, there are no right or wrong answers. It's whatever the answer is for you. Whatever comes for you is the answer. 
thinking about that team, what kind of team is that team? Is there anything else about that team? And does that team have a shape or a size? And when that team is that kind of team and has that shape and that size and has all that about that team, that's like what? So once again, thinking about how you're, you'd like your team to be, that team is or will be like what? And in order to proceed to the next level, you need some kind of answer to this question. Your team will be or is like what? When it's as you would like it to be. Drawn or written is fine, doesn't matter. Let me give you a few seconds to draw or write your answer. Your team is like what? And then let me set up the next part of the activity. By the way, we're going to go over the hour. I hope nobody has to leave on the sharp on the hour because this is going to run over the hour mark. Is that okay with everybody? Probably pick up some more people when the football ends. <laughs> um, okay, let me explain the next round of the activity. Here's what's going to happen in your breakout rooms. You're going to take it in turns to be the person talking about your future team and the person asking some of these clean language questions, these precision inquiry questions. The two we're going to use are what kind of X and is there anything else about X? What kind of X? And is there anything else about X? Let me copy those into the chat. You can use these questions in any order, as many times as you like. You probably want a demonstration of what I'm talking about. Is somebody willing to be the demonstration subject while I show you how this whole activity works, Dan? So for you, your team will be like what? It will be coherent, it will be together. Yeah. What kind of coherent? We joined at the hip. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else about joined at the hip? We know the direction that we're heading towards. Mm -hmm. And is there anything else about joined at the hip? Um, no, it, 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 we, we really are together. We know the direction we're heading and we're kind of marching along. We, we, I, I, I'm kind of sticking to that coherency, that, you mm -hmm. know, that, if that is a word. Yeah. yeah. And what, what kind of sticking? Right now, I don't feel we're part of, we're, being, we're, we're, we're a very good team. Um, oh yeah, we're digging into this now. Yeah, it's, it's right now, we're, we're not really, it doesn't feel like we're a team. So right. is, is there anything else about joined at the hip? Yeah, we're a team. Mm -hmm. We're a team. Yeah. Thank you for that brilliant demonstration. It really will be as quick as that. There, there probably won't be enough time to uh, ask more than two or three of these questions, but hopefully it will still give you an experience of the, the clean language questions. So start off by asking the person to what your team will be like, what? So they say a few words, then ask these two questions in any order as many times as you've got time for. Now, once again, I'm going to divide the group into um, roughly threes, um, but I appreciate that not everybody can join the groups. So here's what's going to happen. I'm going to set the timer for five minutes plus the 60 second countdown. If you find you've only got two of you, you can divide that time equally between two of you. If you find you've got three of you, please divide it between three. And if 
you find yourself on your own, sit tight and I will add you to a different group and then there'll have to be a bit of reshuffling. There isn't a lot of time for saying who's going to go first. So dive in, have, have a go, see what happens. Does that make sense to everybody? Mm -hmm. Let's see what happens. Clicking the button now. Fabio, are you not joining again? In which case I'll move your partner. Yeah, sorry, I'm going to stay, stay in the main room. Thank you. Okay, I'm just going to move your person, your partner to his, so that he's got people to play with. Thank you. Are you, are you wanting to join or it looks like you haven't got yourself into a breakout and I don't know why not. I didn't join because I want to okay. show that I have bought this book, you know. This book. <laughs> huh? Excellent. What do you think? Do you like it, this book? Yes, I think it's a very, very good book. Have you got this one yet? uh becoming agile by La laura Reed turner i know laura i know yeah i know i know laura yeah yeah she's got it? yeah it, it only came out this month but uh it's got a bunch of bits about clean in it uh -huh. small bits i know laura yeah let me take a note so i can eventually contact her Um, one second, let me becoming a child. Okay, thank you. Because I hosted the many authors of books, because you, you can imagine during this pandemic, a lot of people decided to write books. Mm. Okay, so there, are, there is a, a lot of new opportunities of learning after the pandemic. Actually, I designed a couple of games, so I can perfectly understand <laughs> that. Yeah, so the, the clean, clean Language for Coaches isn't one of the books I automatically re recommend because it's much more about one-on-one -on -one coaching than group coaching. Mm -hmm. And in groups like this, I'm typically expecting people to be coaching groups. Yep. Am I right? Yes, yes. However, let me say that uh, reading this book uh, is much easier after your, let me call, lessons or interaction with you that you actually introduced to the clean, introduced myself to the clean language. So everything was absolutely clear. And I'm not sure if this is so clear as a first reading to someone mm. that uh, uh, doesn't know anything about clean language. That, yeah, that's I, th I think people should definitely get my book. <laughs> yeah but it is a bit old but um yeah so i was just uh thinking which books to recommend and when i um was thinking about doing the slides for this i put <laughs> my own book and uh, kate and walker's because i think they're the most relevant obviously <laughs> So your book is your clean language question as well. Is this your book? So the the one with the, the rainbow leaves, which is clean ah, language, okay. revealing metaphors and opening minds okay. was actually I should I should get a copy to wave, shouldn't I? So this wow. one, this one came out um, 2008, I think it was. So it's a long time ago um, and it's 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 out of date, but it's still selling and people are still interested in it. Um, your clean language questions answered is just a little ebook that people can download and ah, okay. get started. 
good good reference good reference now are we supposed to run for 90 minutes total or you feel free i think yeah. that uh, the football game is over because i heard i just heard something yeah <laughs> so i suppose that england uh, passed it and, and won the game but not sure so as you as you i mean it's up to you yeah. judy so okay. we have no limitations Let, let's see what happens and see who yeah, wants exactly, to stay and, exactly. stay and talk the of the session for sure so the last people rejoining from the breakout rooms i yeah. don't know if uh from your breakout room could you hear that shout that just went up There was a very loud shout that was audible from where from, from in the plenary session you could hear it. <laughs> yeah, I, I hear it. That's why I, I think I the game is over. Yeah. Which uh, Yes, it's done. I'm in a very quiet residential part of the world, so no. <laughs> <laughs> However, the game is over. Confirmed. England okay. won, beat the Germany two to zero. Ah. That's that's the shout. <laughs> yeah, from from my office, I can hear the the pub garden a few doors away. So, <laughs> so if 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 anybody, uh, so this is where all the cameras come on for anybody who's been somewhat distracted by uh, the game in the background. Um, so I understand that it was a magnificent England victory. <laughs> And you could, for, for those of us sitting here in the main room, you could definitely hear the shouts. Um, <laughs> so um, hopefully uh, that, that isn't too interesting to you and you were able to participate in the activity. I want to debrief that activity in two different ways. One is to ask you what your answer was. Your team will be like what? My invitation to you is to write your answer in the chat. So let's see everybody's answer in the chat. Your team will be like what? So I think this will be informative to a whole bunch of us. What kind of teams are people looking forward to? The All Blacks, like a net. Cycling racing team. There was another astonishing one of those today. For Mandelbrot said, oh, interesting, the rubber teapot. Formula One racing team, spider web. Isn't it interesting what people come up with? Well-oiled and maintained machine, lovely stuff. Thank you very much. Yeah, so one's at the front and leads at the back. I've seen that photograph, really nice. So thank you very much for sharing those. So that's one level of debrief for this activity. Next up, question. How was it when you were asked those questions? Did you, yeah, how was it when you were asked the questions? What was that experience like for you? Mike, what about you? Thought provoking and uh, not uncomfortable, just you know, feeling a, a, a comfortable challenge. Mm -hmm. A comfortable challenge and thought provoking. Who had a different experience to that? Um, I did because. Um, most people didn't understand why I chose Rover, so it felt very um, intrusive. Um, wanting to know more of something that I had not thought of, but mm -hmm. it did help me um, quickly come up with uh, a creative way of answering the question. So, hmm. yeah. so people wanted to know more, and it helped you come up with other things. Yes, on the spot. Yeah. On the spot. Yeah. So it does, it's a, you know it, it can be a little bit challenging. Who who had a, a similar or a different experience? I guess for me, the, yeah, similar and different. Yeah, going both. Um, the <laughs> challenge was trying to articulate whatever is going on in my subconscious to come up with, because mine was the Mandelbrot set. There's no connection to anything physical on that one. But there must have been a reason why it came out. So it was working out what that was. That was hard. Mm -hmm. But a bit of rambling later, and then I seemed to stumble upon things which seemed to make sense. And notice how quickly that bit of rambling happened with these questions. Even given that, if, even if you sna snaffled the whole six minutes for yourself, did you? 
Uh, no, I think we were quite even. I think we did about sort of right. three and three. Or In which case, three two. and three. In three minutes, you came up with something to express this complex concept of a team working geographically remotely, but also potentially asynchronously. And this is a typical kind of experience that different groups have when they use clean language. Um, I won't go into too much of a spiel about what's great about clean language, but there is some magic in it. For example, in these questions, they're unique in that they have a space for the other person's words. One of the, there are a couple of things about that. One is that it forces the questioner to listen to what the other person says. If you know you're going to have to use their words, you have to actually listen to what they say. That's important. And it helps to build the next big thing with these questions, which is that when people hear their own words being played back to them, it helps them to feel understood. It helps them to do their best thinking. It helps them to be creative and to say what's really true for them. There's a quote I like from, um, I, I should have all my quotes on my slides or I, I lose track of who said what, um, but there's a, a guy who's a negotiation trainer who used to be the FBI's chief hostage negotiator, Chris Voss. And he says that parrot phrasing or mirroring somebody's language using their words is the nearest thing that the FBI has to a Jedi mind trick. And I think he's right. Now, I didn't know, I, I don't know Chris Voss. I hadn't uh, met Chris Voss when I started getting into clean language and when I co-authored the clean language book back in 2008. But we'd already noticed this magic when people hear their own words coming back to them, they do feel that they've been listened to. They feel that the other person understands them. And that's a high value thing when it comes to groups and teams. So if you wanted to have a detailed conversation with your team, for example, um, somebody in the chat earlier on posted, they said they think that people should have the choice about whether they work remotely or whether they come into the office. And I absolutely agree that as far as possible, sh people should be choiceful in these matters. But organizations and teams need to have some challenging conversations around that because not everything can be done fully remotely and what if some members of the team want things to be back to normal and everybody back together and other members of the team want to stay fully remote? How do you balance these pressures? All of that is where, when we at Reese McCann, Abby is one, one of the people who does this, uh, delivers a program called Collaboration Dynamics using clean language with groups and teams we help teams to negotiate these kind of things. Because we're just coming up to the hour, I'm going to lightning quickly mention some resources that people might want to follow up and then dive into what questions does everybody have. Is that OK? OK, so these um, resources are, of course, mentioned in the slide deck that's been shared a couple of times in the chat. Um, there are three books I'm going to recommend. One is the book I co-authored a few years ago, Clean Language Revealing Metaphors and Opening Minds. It's, um, it's old, but it's still good. It's currently being translated into German. Um, it's also been translated into uh, Russian and Japanese. Um, so it, it's, it's still worth getting, is what people think. The other one I've put on the slide is Caitlin Walker's book, From Contempt to Curiosity. Caitlin Walker uh, writes specifically about using um, clean language with groups and teams. 
Caitlin has an interesting background in that she originally studied uh, computer science. And if her life had panned out differently, she might well have been an agile coach now, but she's not. And uh, she went off and she did work with uh, underprivileged youth, um, youth, youth excluded from school, those kind of people. So her work with groups and teams has been tested with some of the toughest groups that it's possible to work with. Teenagers who are more likely to thump you than ask you how your day has been. So she's worth reading. And the third resource is a free resource that I put together. It's a short ebook called Your Clean Language Questions Answered, which hopefully answers some of your clean language questions. Do dig into that and um, it, it will also put you in touch with me to, to get any questions answered. You can also, if you're interested, ask myself, Abby, or anyone at Reese McCann about collaboration dynamics. And the other stuff we do includes um, creating highly engaging online events. Today's been a mini example where we use lots of breakout rooms, get conversations going, that kind of thing. Um, supporting and facilitating online events is our main line of business. Also in the, in the um, slides, you can find all the links to connect with me. I'm easy to find online. Um, the other Judy Reese is a real estate agent in Florida. It's easy to tell us apart. And when all of that, what difference does knowing all of this make? And what questions do you have for me? Or comments about all of this? Please make your question to the content of tonight. Remote meeting, clean language. Judy is a real expert. Now, if you're feeling nervous about asking your questions, I'm tempted to pop you into breakout rooms to invite you to chat about how this evening has been for you before coming, bringing you back, having you having met someone and talked about your questions before asking you again, what questions do you have? Have people got time for that? It'll also give you an opportunity to, to meet someone additional, new. So slightly larger breakout rooms this time with a slightly less ruthless, no, again, we're gonna make, make the time, time box ruthless, four minutes, opening the rooms. And at the end, we'll have a, a larger conversation about your questions. Open the rooms now. The others will be back in just a minute or a few seconds. How's, the, how's this evening's session been for you? How do you how do I pronounce your name? If if I if it Ivailo. Ivailo. It, it's it's very nice. I just have some questions about in what kind of situations this this can be used. Great. Uh, but, I, but I really like it, and it's very close because I have studied MVC environment mm -hmm. communication. It's very close to that actually as a mindset as a way to 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 communicate. Yeah, I think that there are some similar there are some subtle differences, but there are distinct similarities. Welcome back. Now, have we got a few more questions? Ivailo was just asking me. Um, go ahead, ask your question. Well, yeah, and what kind of situations we can we can use that kind of approach? For example, can we use it for conflict resolution in a team, or can we use it in uh, decision making, <laughs> or or maybe some examples or some practical examples would be helpful. Yeah. Mm. Absolutely, it can be used in, in conflict resolution and in decision making. One of its most useful and simplest uh, applications is simply helping to get clarity on what somebody means by what they say. So a lovely example is um, a business analyst um, I know called Ro Roland Hill. There's a story online of him going into a he was just tying up some user, some stories that he needed to write down. It was well into the development of this piece of software. And it was two banks merging, a Belgian bank and a Dutch bank. And having studied clean language, he realized that, that there was a jargon word, piece of technical banking jargon in Dutch stroke Flemish. And he started thinking, what if they didn't mean exactly the same thing by that word? 
and it asked some clean language questions and got clarity about what each of them meant by the word and it was different and it was one of those situations where this misunderstanding would have been catastrophic for the project so that's a really nice story that's written up somewhere on on, on the internet and you can you can read all about it um, but those kind of misunderstandings can also lead to all sorts of conflicts so um, there's an example in Caitlin Walker's book where somebody is asked um, you know when this project is as you would like it will be like what and she says it'll be unclear and the boss goes bananas what do you mean unclear you're always trying to spoil everything um because and and caitlin asked because she was facilitating the meeting stop to ask boss for you unclear is like what what kind of unclear is your unclear? And for the woman, what kind of unclear is your unclear? And the woman's unclear is it's like a beautiful landscape where we can wander freely and we've got autonomy. And for the boss, when she said unclear, he obviously interpreted as wandering in a fog and we wouldn't know what was going on. But the same word unclear meant two very different things to two different people. So in conflict resolution, and, and clean language has been used in some fairly major conflict resolution, a colleague, Martin Snodden, is involved in peace building or has been involved first in peace building in Northern Ireland and then did some work in uh, South Africa and also in Israel, Palestine. Um, there's a book on my shelves over there about, uh, it's a textbook on, uh, on mediation by a lady called Jerry O'Sullivan. And she's got a whole chapter in there about how clean language can be used in mediation. So effectively, clean language can be used anywhere where clear communication between parties is high value. Dan. Yeah, can I share an experience as well? Um, we do quarterly agile assessments of our teams, team maturity, and then after a while, teams get bored of it. You know, why are we doing this? Waste of time and, and, and lack of interest. And so I, based on what I'm learning or learned about clean language, actually, I now, as a facilitator, I now start with, so we've been doing this now for, for, for a couple of years. Um, and, and the feedback I'm hearing is, 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 oh, no, we're doing agile assessments again. For the next two hours to be really useful for you, it would be like what? Love it. And I get such wonderful, I, I get, well, I want to make sure we're all talking. I want to make sure there's collaboration. I want to know what we're doing wrong, or I want to know how we can improve. And as a facilitator, I'm able to come, I'm able to get from people. One is accountability, because they're saying to me, I want to make sure we're all talking. And I want to make sure we're coming out with, with some clear actions. And as a facilitator, what this helps me doing is, is I capture these on a board. And I continuously refer to them over the two hours saying, are we, are we actually achieving the conversation that you want and the actions that you want? And so it helps guide me, but it also helps, I think, people make themselves more accountable to achieving the outcomes that they said at the very beginning of the meeting. Something so simple has had such a great effect for me as, as a facilitator. So that's another way that I'm using this as well. So um, to help guide the conversation. That's a lovely example that we can bring back to this idea of having conversations about the future of our workplaces and how remote or how um, mm. office space we want to be mm. when we have that conversation that conversation it will be like what mm. Mm. i use it a lot now and it, it, it mm. brings wonderful um, um things to the table um so yeah it's, it's really really good so in Dan's example and a bunch of examples, there's a combination of metaphor. So that question, it would be like what, deliberately asks for a metaphor, though of course people may not answer it with some deliberate metaphor. They, they might answer it with different kinds of words, but typically there's always metaphor in there somewhere because you language basically is, is completely packed with metaphors. We talk at about six metaphors a minute 
you can't you can't not use metaphor but it's possible to use the the questions like what kind of x is there anything else about x about pretty much anything you don't need to be deliberately seeking out metaphors to use them what i would suggest though is when you're first using them don't try and solve all the world's problems with those questions. Just start using more of those questions, one or two at a time in everyday conversation, and they will undoubtedly enrich the conversations you have. And more questions. Who's got more questions, observations, comments? Or did you all sit in your breakout rooms and not talk about questions? I'm going to start calling on people in a minute. Bob, what, what have you made of today? Um, I'm trying to... I'm trying to integrate this whole thing because I've read a couple of books and mm -hmm. I'm just trying to see where I would do it in a uh, couple of situations and I'm not ready to talk about them. But they're, okay. Um, but yeah, I think just the, your suggestion to just start using them more often. Um, I know that when I have used them, they've had, I've had better conversations. I've had more um, interesting results, I'll say. Thank you. I'm, I'm deeply curious, but I, I shall not probe, not pry. Not right um, now. <laughs> <laughs> David, what about you? Um, so I've seen clean language um experienced and practiced some bits of it but never actually put it into day-to-day -day practice so i was thinking about how i can make this more an intentional practice by maybe writing the questions and having them in front of me so that i can refer on them and and draw on them and it was something that you did a couple of months back you did a, a session on webinars and some things like soft starts and things like that so i took some of those and i made them intentional practices and now i integrate them more daily so it's it's now what am I actually going to take from what you have here and make it an intentional practice? Mm. Uh, yeah. yeah, just stick in those two questions on a post-it note on your computer screen. Um, yep. I, I can report yeah, that that, that that appears to work for a lot of people. Yeah. <laughs> <that. Dend> <laughs> yeah. Can I, the, 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 there's something else that I've been experimenting with as well. We're doing a lot of team liftoffs right now, which is Diane Larson's book on, on liftoff. It's a great book uh, if, you, if you're forming new teams. And in there, we spend time talking about values. As a team, what values do we, um, do we want to live up to? Um, and so at the very beginning, it's very good. And, and sadly, what happens is, uh, we've all probably been guilty of this, we'll, we'll pick some values and then we just kind of, kind of, well, for, done that exercise, great, tick in the box, we're all done. What I'm doing is, and again, thanks to clean language, I'm actually, when someone chooses like teamwork or collaboration, or I'm actually asking, is there anything else about collaboration? And all of a sudden, I'm filling this mural board up with all these different words that, that the team are using to describe collaboration. And what's really interesting is how differing the, opin the opinions are of what we truly mean by collaboration. And the other word I use, or the other question out of David Grove's questions is, um, what will you what will you see and hear? In fact, that's not one of, I don't think that's, I'm sorry, I've got his questions down here, actually on the left of my, my I don't think that was one of the questions, but I, I do ask, what will you see and hear when there is trust? Boom, the, you know, the conversation you ignite within a team about what you will see and hear. And by doing this, you're also, you're also the team are making themselves accountable because they're saying when there's trust i will see and hear this and it's fantastic conversation i mean we, we spend an hour just talking about five values and it's it's so again thanks to the clean language it's made me a better facilitator and a better agile coach in in, in helping people uncover some of these things so that's another way i'm using it and, and just for historical accuracy what will you see and hear is one of Caitlin Walker's builds right. on what David did. Mm -hmm. So David's original questions, uh, uh, you know, he threw them out into the world and, and, and they've, they've, they've grown wings. <laughs> Sarah, I'm just going to ask quickly. Um, so because I joined a bit late and uh, play language is new to me, 
so the goal and your overall objective of using plain language or introducing uh, plain language into um, um, our, the process it, does it does is the ultimate goal to ensure that uh, everyone's on board and everyone has a common understanding of a particular um, word or a particular sentence or a particular statement is, is, is that the goal that everyone is on board and everyone thinks the exact same way um, that the intent that's intended uh, correct me if I'm wrong I just wanted to... uh, I, I would say no that's not the goal so clean language is a, a tool it's it doesn't itself have a goal so like a, a saucepan that can be used to make all sorts of different recipes and can also be used to bail out a boat. Clean language can be used in a whole bunch of ways, some of which it was designed for and some of which it, it, it just turns out to be really useful for. Um, it was designed, I would say, to help people understand their own thinking better and indeed its origin is from from psychotherapy or hypnotherapy the idea being that it helps the, the the client in therapy to understand what's going on for them and to change it so as a pure coaching tool dex was waving the clean language for coaches book a moment ago as a pure coaching tool it's intended to help um clean approaches for coaches sorry um it's intended to support the coach one-on-one -on -one coaching client to understand their own thinking find their own motivation for change and make their own changes in the context of groups and teams and in the context we're talking about which is organizations having a difficult conversation about a complex subject the main purpose would be for each individual to understand everyone else's point of view. Now, a side effect of that understanding everybody else's point of view is that it becomes much easier to reach agreement, but clean language doesn't have a goal in that context any more than a saucepan cares what we cook in it. Does that answer the question? Yes, it does actually, um, and I'm glad you sort of um, put it in the context of um, teams and context of um, individual itself. Um, so yes, I have an, an understanding of um, how it could be applied in different um, um, contexts and situations. So, but not one thing exactly. So, thanks. Thank you. It's nearly twenty-five past. Is there one more question from anybody, or comment, or observation? I was thinking of um, trying to use uh, this kind of approach at a retrospective. So ask the team to come up with a, a metaphor. Your last sprint was like, and then um, maybe ask them to delve into, you know, the, using that clean language, those two sentences to go deeper into each of their different metaphors to see if um, that would work. Um, is that something that anyone's tried? Yes, definitely people have tried it. Um, I, I, think, I think it's a good idea and I think it's a natural um, way to get started. And can I add a health warning? One of the things about these questions is that they can, they, they deepen the emotional state that you start with. So if you ask somebody about a really wonderful time they've had or what they want or what they hope for or what they dream of, they will get more excited, more interesting, interested, more um, hopeful and all of those good things. If on the other hand, you ask them uh, about something that was an unpleasant experience that will deepen unpleasant emotions. So in a retrospective, rather than necessarily go for a big metaphor about this last sprint was like what, um, I might ask first, 
what's one thing you enjoyed about this sprint? And then ask two or three questions about that. Um, just by time limiting the amount of questions people can ask, that can avoid getting into too much unpleasantness. So you could say, what's one thing you enjoyed about this sprint? And ask two or three of those questions about that. And then what's something you'd like to be different? And ask two or three questions about that. So you, you just make it a little bit smaller to avoid the danger of going, well, that last sprint was like a complete nightmare. And then you spent 20 minutes working out what kind of nightmare and you've got detailed drawings of the zombies and uh, completely accurate pictures of the various um, tunnels and um, moments of complete nakedness in front of the boss and all the rest of it all over the walls. We don't need that. We need smaller chunks to get people started because that will be more comfortable for everybody. Is that a reasonable answer? Yeah. Thank you. Um, Dan, Abby, have you done retrospectives using clean language? No. I, I haven't, and I... Uh, no, I haven't, no. Um, but it's given me an idea. Yeah, I know, <laughs> it's given me one too, yeah. So, um, I know 15-minute um, photo by Mike Burrows, um, he, he, if you go on to agendashift.com and look for 15 minute photo, F-O-T-O, um, he's done some work there using clean language and which you could, you could see how it could work. I think it's changing or from obstacles to outcomes. Um, and there's some neat little ideas there using clean language. And I refer to that a lot as well to help teams kind of work through unknown unknowns and things like that. So that's, that, that's good. You know, I've had, I've had some, some good responses there. So. Okay, so if I if I is asking resources I recommended. So um, in the slides, you'll find a link to the the ebook Your Clean Language Questions Answered. That's a quick and easy place to start. Um, grab hold of this book, grab hold of Caitlin's book, go on to reesmccann.com where there are a whole bunch of blog posts that I've written over the last 10, 10 or 12 years. And the latest book to come out to mention clean language is Laura Reed Turner's Becoming Agile. Came out three weeks ago. It's it's about becoming agile, but it's got a number of references to clean language. Lisa Atkins is referencing clean language. Um, there's some stuff from Caitlin Walker in it. Um, so all sorts of people are just playing with clean language in different agile contexts. And it's 29 minutes past, we should finish on time. Thank you very much indeed for playing with all of this. And um, thank you. See you again soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Judy. Thank you, Judy. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Judy. Thank you. 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 Thank you.